Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NBTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I'm Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. So uh, I welcome you all very warmly to uh, week number 10 of this uh, course on adaptive control. Um, we are, as always, motivated by uh, very, very cool and very interesting autonomous systems uh, that you know support us and also enthrall us such as uh, the spacex satellite that you see in the background orbiting the earth uh, until last time we were already well into the way uh, for learning how to design uh, algorithms that will drive systems such as you know what you see uh, in our background, which is the SpaceX satellite. Um, what we're doing specifically um, is to learn the a tuning function method for adaptive control design. All right. So this is uh, uh, one of the more advanced and one of the more recent um, methods in uh, nonlinear adaptive control. And of course, it is still based on backstepping, but it also required knowledge of you know, control Lyapunov functions and such. Uh, and it extended the notion of control Lyapunov functions to adaptive systems, right? Uh, and then we sort of were able to use this uh, in a uh, backstepping setting. That is in a case when uh, you have, a, uh, you know, backstepping level or backstepping layer in the system, right? And in such cases also, we showed that if you do have, a, you know, a, an, an asymptotic, adaptive asymptotic stabilizability of systems such as this, then adding an integrator uh, still helps you retain this adaptive asymptotic stabilizability property. And we even showed the construction of an augmented, uh, you know, uh, adaptive CLF for this system. And once you have this augmented adaptive CLF, we uh, were able to uh, help construct a feedback and also an update law, of course. An update law was, of course, constructed earlier using the adaptive, uh, like a tuning function method, right? Uh, we also worked out an example, which we had already worked out with the, you know, say the extended, the integrator backstepping method and the extended design. Um, and this was the unmatched, uh, you know, parameter case. Now, the solution turned out to be very, very interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. In fact, uh, um, at one point, it seemed like it baffled me also. Yeah, uh, because I could see some quadratics in the parameters. But that's the really cool thing, right, about this kind of a construction. Right. So, so this is the sort of, uh, you know, you we had and an alpha basically and then using this alpha we designed our backstepping error and using the backstepping error we were able to define an aclf for the integrator system right and the interesting thing for us to see was that the control uh, contained uh, quadratic in the unknowns right there is a unknown term here and an unknown term here so obviously this is quadratic in the unknowns and this is where we, you know, sort of, I had to stop a little bit myself to uh, think if, um, you know, I was getting it right or not. Yeah, but nothing to worry, right? We, of course, had to be very careful because of the vector mathematics involved. I would really strongly urge you to look at this example carefully and also do this yourself. Yeah, because if you cannot do this, you'll not be able to handle any real applied problem. And, and that's, and therefore, this is critical that, it's critical that you actually follow this example completely. Do not worry about the fact that I got quadratic terms here. Eventually, the control still requires you to replace p by p hat, so which is like the certainty equivalence idea, right? Uh, so anyway, so this is, I mean, this is of course expanded into this here. It's the same thing, I'm just expanded out here. 
right? Um, and then, of course, we had the adaptive law. So the control, in the control, like I said, the P gets replaced by a P cap. Yeah, I really hope uh, that you are no longer confused. And I also hope that you have been able to do this kind of a problem, or in fact, this particular problem itself. I would strongly urge all of you to do this by hand yourself. Yeah, the exact same problem. Okay. And then uh, for the tuning function, of course, we had already given a formula. And this is a precise, precise formula. And we simply apply the formula. All right. So all we do is take a partial of the original uh, ACLF for the original system. Uh, and with respect to X, and then minus Z del alpha del X, which take in the original feedback alpha, and then multiply it with F. And, and so, and then in our case, F is the small f. So, you know, all this nice uh, expression appears. Um, and again, you have, again, in this case, you have the P hats in the update law itself. This is again something very interesting, right? In your parameter update law, because tau is essentially the parameter update law, right? It's the expression for a parameter update is this guy. Right. So your parameter update law, in fact, does contain p hats also. Yeah, this is not something that we have seen until now. Yeah, only the tuning function method. But remember, the tuning function method is alleviating both the issues that we had in our earlier designs. In the integrative backstepping method, the issue was that there was an additional estimate for the same parameter. And in the tuning function, uh, sorry, and in the extended matching design, the issue was the appearance of theta hat dot, okay, in the uh, one level extended matching. That is when the control was one level below the unknown parameter. But here, in this case, nothing of that sort happens. You do not see any p hat dots appearing here. In fact, you can do any level. Your control can be 10 levels below, but it doesn't matter. You will not see a derivative of the parameter here. Yeah, but of course you can see the constru construction of the tuning function and alpha one and all these are way more complicated and therefore different. Okay, so this I hope you appreciate this. All right, excellent. So moving on to this week. Yeah, again we are in week ten, but we are looking at the week eleven notes. Please do not worry. Yeah, this is I've already mentioned. This is just for uh, you know tallying our homeworks and nothing else. Yeah, so I wouldn't worry much about it. Okay. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, so what we want to do this week is a slightly different topic, if you may. I mean, still adaptive control, of course, but we want to deal with the robustness question. Okay. So robustness um, is one of the big, big challenges in adaptive control. All right. Um, so big, I would say big challenge and concern right so let me mark let me mark this as lecture uh, 10.1 right so so robustness has been a big challenge and a concern in adaptive control um because yeah, initially when uh, folks started doing adaptive control it was in fact very well received and it became uh, one of the cornerstones of nonlinear control and in our excitement uh, to try out adaptive control uh, um, this was one of the few of those nonlinear controls which did actually get implemented in uh, at such a fast pace in a, an actual scenario and this was um, uh, you know, sort of a fighter plane uh, in the US, yeah, one of the fighter planes, and of course, it was a test bed, yeah. However, uh, this as uh, an adaptive control law worked rather poorly and uh, displayed very poor robustness, and in fact, led to the crash of this aircraft, yeah, like this fighter aircraft. And this is where um, things became rather complicated, and uh, a lot of researchers, in fact, uh, started to say that uh, adaptive control is not feasible at all and it is absolutely not robust and therefore it is simply dangerous to use it and uh, there was a lot of height uh, there was a little bit of a hiatus in on research in adaptive control also because 
the thought was that uh, it has no future in some sense. Okay. Um, so this was this is the sort of issue that we want to highlight uh, in this week. And we also want to highlight, of course, we are researchers, right? So uh, somebody did find a solution to this robustness issue in adaptive control. So the first thing that we want to do is to highlight the robustness issue. And then uh, we want to move on to even uh, try to solve this robustness issue or, or methods to solve this robustness issue. Okay. So... And so that's what we want to do. Yeah, uh, look at this big robustness. Issue. What is this big problem here? Yeah, and which which um, although you have done adaptive control for such a long time, I am quite sure that unless you've seen adaptive control before this, this would this issue would not have occurred to you. Okay. Uh, so what we want to look at are systems with disturbance. Okay. So this is very uh, realistic, right? Any any real dynamical systems has external disturbance. For example, if you have an airplane that's flying, you have wind disturbance. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's one of the simplest possible disturbance. Um, I mean, you can you can have you know you can have actuators which are not exactly functioning uh, the way you want them to. Therefore, you know it's uh, it's producing more power or less power than what you want to. That's disturbance. Uh, anything that's not well modeled can lead to a disturbance, um, and it can be sort of captured as a disturbance, not lead to, but can be captured as a disturbance because disturbance is typically assumed to be unknown but a bounded quantity. All right. So, so therefore, uh, disturbance is ubiquitous in a plant. Yeah? Ubiquitous in any dynamical system. Yeah. So almost always you want to have controllers which are robust against disturbance yeah if they're not then you have a problem yeah because um, then you're no longer in the domain of uh, you know something that can be used in a real situation yeah it's very nice to you know sort of uh, write good theorems and proofs but it cannot be used yeah because your theorems and proofs are all based on idealized system with no disturbance if you notice none of the uh, you know, dynamics that we have considered until now had any kind of disturbance. Yeah, so it would absolutely be unusable. Yeah, if you were considering a case where there is disturbance. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Let's see where the problem arises. Yeah, we are again looking at this very very simple system, scalar system. X dot is a x plus u. Yeah. As usual, a is unknown. X is a scalar. And we want to, uh, so I'm going to write that A is unknown. Yeah. And we want to solve the tracking problem, right? which is E, I mean, E equals X minus XM goes to zero, where XM is the you know, smooth bounded signal that we want to track. Yeah. The same arguments can be made for any kind of adaptive control problem, be it the MRAC problem or the you know backstepping type such in, uh, situations. Uh, so we just focus on the simplest case. So what do we do? As usual, we construct the error dynamics, which is E dot is X dot minus XM dot, which is AX plus U minus XM dot. Right? And then we do the best. We uh, in when you know the parameter, you you know cancel it. Cancel the drift term, uh, cancel the tracking term, and introduce a nice good term, right? Which gives you e dot is minus ke in the ideal case, and so this is the we are considering the ideal case problem. So we have and we use v equal to half e squared as the candidate Lee Apollo function. Okay, all good. Um, now what happens when there is disturbance? Just like I said, what is the nature of disturbance? This is the standard assumption that you would see in any problem where disturbance is introduced. Uh, the general uh, assumption is that disturbance is bounded. So the infinity norm of the disturbance is generally denoted as d max. Yeah. Or I mean, whatever. I mean, is equal to d max or less than equal to d max. Either one is fine. I mean, you just need an upper bound. Okay. But of course, you do not know the exact nature of the, it could also be time varying. It's most probably time varying. Yeah, it's most probably time varying. So, of course, we assume it is time varying. So, in this case, what happens? Since I do not know D, that cannot appear in my control law. So, my control law remains exactly the same. This is the known case. Okay. 
known parameter case. All right, so it's, that's what is written here. So in fact, I should not probably write this. A is not assumed to be known. A is actually known. Okay, so A is known. All right, so this is the known parameter case. Great. So what happens? I use the same control law because that is the best I can do. D is not known. Yeah. So my error dynamics is no longer minus ke, e dot is minus ke because I could not cancel the d term here. Therefore, e dot became minus ke plus a d. Okay, because if I want to write it out more carefully, um, with this x dot, my e dot would be uh, ax plus u plus d of t minus xm dot. Okay, and if I substitute the same control here, yeah, this is what you will get. This is what you will get. You will just be left with the D. And then I continue to use the same Lyapunov function, candidate Lyapunov function. Again, because D is not known, so I cannot really construct a Lyapunov function corresponding to something that's unknown. Okay, so it doesn't make sense, right? So when I now when I do the Lyapunov analysis with this candidate function, let us carefully see what happens. This is called the standard uh, disturbance analysis using Lyapunov functions or bounding analysis or uniform ultimate boundedness analysis. Okay, so let's see what happens. Yeah, uh, the derivative is e times e dot, so it's just e times this guy, and I get something like this. All right, and now. Uh, if I do a sum of squares, right? what is sum of squares? As usual, I use, I mean, I can do something better, but let me just use this. Uh, e d is less than or equal to half e squared plus half d squared. Okay, this is the standard you know, sum of squares. Basically, I have use a b is less than or equal to a squared plus b squared. Uh, in fact, this is, I mean, that's fine. Maybe. You can use the absolute value if you want, or there's a square, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's what I do. I use this expression here, and I get k minus half e squared plus absolute value of e squared by 2. Okay, so this should also be e squared. I mean, I mean, you can use again the absolute value can be used to make it more precise, but honestly, it's a scalar, so and it's squared, so absolute value is irrelevant. If it was a vector, this would be a norm. Yeah, so that you should remember. Now, since I know that the infinity norm of D, that is the infinity norm is the supremum norm, right? So the largest value D can take is upper bounded by D max. So I will say less than or equal to. Yeah, since the largest value this guy can take is less than or equal to D max, I can just substitute this D max here. Okay. Now look at what happens. This is not exactly negative definite anymore. If it was only this term, which is what you would get in the ideal case. Actually, in the ideal case, you will not even have this. You will just get this. Right? Now, if it was just this term still, this would be negative definite. Okay. But it is not. Right? It is something more. There is a term in the disturbance. So what do I do? Now I know that this e square is actually just v, twice v. Okay? So I write it as such. I write e square as tie twice v and I get something like this. Okay, so this is missing a. Uh, yeah, we are missing this thing. Okay, it's something I take, I take uh, 2k minus 1 common from here, right? And uh, because this is twice v. I write this as twice v, so the two cancels out. So this becomes 2k minus 1. I take that common out here, and this becomes d max square divided by twice 2k minus 1. So what do I know about this? Okay, what do I know about this? Uh, this is interesting. Okay. Uh, the property that this quantity has is that whenever v is larger than this guy, larger than this this is negative and when v is smaller than this this is positive okay 
So if I try to make a picture, that's what I want to do. I want to make a picture here. So nice axis. Right. So this is in my x axis, I have say, uh, whatever I add, I'll have my time in the x axis, I guess. And in the y axis, suppose I plot V. Yeah, V is essentially E squared, but still I want to plot V. Okay. And suppose I make, uh, you know, uh, suppose I make my line. In fact, I can, I'll also want to plot E. So that's fine. Suppose I make my straight line corresponding to. Yeah, so this straight line corresponds to uh, d squared max divided by 2 minus 1, divided by twice 2k minus 1. So this is it. Okay, so what is the nature of v based on this analysis? So based on the fact that v dot has this kind of a structure. Notice that 2k minus 1 is greater than 0. So, say so assume greater to great. We assume, of course, that. We, of course, assume that k has to be greater than 1 half. All right. Uh, then, what's the nature of this plot? Right. So, whenever your uh, v is outside, Right, this this thing, right? Whenever we is beyond this guy, so then whenever v is larger than this, okay. Whenever v is larger than this, then this v is actually a decreasing function. So suppose it starts somewhere here. Uh, in fact, I would like to also extend this a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Suppose V starts beyond this guy, right, uh, here, then this has to be a decreasing function. And once it goes inside, it can do anything. Yeah, it can be increasing, decreasing and so on and so forth. So remember that V is uh, greater than zero, so v greater than equal to zero. So it cannot, of course, lie below the, uh, you know, lie below this guy. Okay, so this is the plot for v. Uh, I'm going to just plot v in this. Now suppose I plot. Uh, similarly, suppose I plot e. Now the good thing here is that uh, if I make this picture. Right. Suppose I plot E here on this one and I make, now I make this one, right. Remember that V is just one half E squared. So whenever I plot V, it's almost equivalent to plotting E, okay. And so this picture and this picture will have a nice equivalence, right. I mean, nice going back and forth. The only thing is the this plot is on the positive side, this plot will be on both sides, can be on both sides. So suppose I make this side of a picture. Okay. Uh, now I have to make two boundaries. Like this has to be almost the same. So I have drawn two boundaries. One is, uh, I apologize. This one is d max over square root k minus one, and this is minus d max over square root k minus one. Now what happens? The interesting thing is, suppose uh, you have this kind of a picture. 
and I start outside again. Same thing with V, right? If V decreases, it means E also decreases, right? So, so if if V starts outside, right, and it has to decrease, then if E starts outside this boundary, E has to decrease, right? Because V is exactly square of E, no difference, right? So if I start outside now, now the fact that V started above d squared max by 2 2k minus 1 does not the only thing it does not tell us is whether e started positive or negative because v is e squared by 2 okay so this could mean that e started here or it could also mean that e started here okay but let us assume that e did start here it doesn't matter yeah then what it means is if v square is decreasing, v is decreasing, e square is decreasing, which means e has to decrease. And e decreases, I mean, again, not necessarily, I mean, well, I mean, in this case, it is monotonic because of the scalar gain. But once it's inside this line, right, once it's inside this line, it can do anything. It can be oscillatory or whatever. Yeah. The important thing to remember is that it will never get out of this. Okay. So, this is the important thing to remember. Right. Um, solutions never escape this bound. Okay, the solutions never escape this part. All right, why is this? Just give this a little bit. Let's give this a little bit of a thought. So I'm going to sort of extend this guy also. All right, um, and suppose it so happens, right, at some instance, right, that this tries to go here. You know, sort of escape like this. Okay. The question is, is this possible? But notice what happens that at this corner, the vector field, when you get to this boundary, your V is decreasing, which means E has to decrease right across this boundary as soon as you cross it almost instantaneously you cross it it has to the e has to decrease yeah, because v has to decrease yeah so and this gets enforced exactly at this point yeah so if if this trajectory tries to cross this boundary there is a push downwards okay and therefore this trajectory cannot cross it will just curve down and go this way and this can of course be proved analytically we are not proving it of course yeah but uh, this is the important fact that uh, the solutions of this system of such systems will never cross the boundary okay and therefore this kind of a set uh, that you have you know this this sort of a yeah this sort of a set that you have that I'm not drawing in the picture here is called the residual set yeah and the size of this residual set is also very well documented and understood. What is the size of the residual set? It is precisely this. Yeah. So you can guarantee that your error will lie within this guy, within this boundary. Okay. Now, this is a standard feature of almost all uh, Lyapunov analysis. Okay. Almost all strict Lyapunov analysis, if you may. Yeah, when whenever you so in this ideal case, what happens? You get negative definite v dot. So it's a strict Lyapunov function. So typically, disturbance analysis is done with strict Lyapunov functions, and in all those cases, robustness is free. You will always get a residual set. Not just that, 
not only do you guarantee that you get within this set, it's important to notice that the size of the residual set is inversely proportional to your control gain. K. Okay. Your K is in your control, right? It's a control gain, right? Your control is something like this. Yeah. So, uh, increasing K reduces residual set. Okay. Increasing the control gain will reduce your residual set size. Okay. And this is a rather nice cool property. All right. Excellent. So what did we look at in this session? We started this week 10 lecture with a discussion of robustness in adaptive control. We have not really looked at the adaptive control problem at all. But you took a very simple scalar system and uh, tried to understand what disturbance analysis looks like and what's the notion of residual sets and the fact that trajectories starting outside the residual set will converge to inside the residual set if you had a strict Lyapunov function. All right? And this is a real cool feature of any Lyapunov analysis. If you have a strict Lyapunov function in the absence of disturbance, then in the presence of disturbance also you will converge to a nice residual set so you'll have a bounded nice performance not just that the bound can be controlled via the uh, the bound can be controlled via your uh, control gain all right excellent so this is where we stop here continue next thank you